This week on Physio Foundations is part two of my discussion with Ebony Rio from La Trobe University. And on this episode, we're going to dive deeper into the contents and we're going to talk about Ebony's research and her clinical areas of expertise, tendinopathy. Welcome to another episode of the Physio Foundations podcast, a podcast about the knowledge and skills that provide the foundation of expert clinical practice. I'm your host, Luke Perriton, and this is part two of my conversation with tendinopathy expert and sports physiotherapist, Ebony Rio. So if you missed part one, go back and listen to last week's episode where I introduced Ebony and we talk all about her background and her pathway towards expertise, a really nice episode for your own personal and professional development, your own journey towards where you want to go, even if it's not as a sports physiotherapist. Some really interesting tips in there for physios of all levels and students. But if you're all caught up, that's great. Keep listening. Ebony Rio, welcome back to Physio Foundations. Thank you for having me again. All right, let's go back into it. So in part one, we talked about career pathway and tips, um, mentoring. We talked about you know, your journey Let's talk about your research career. And we, we started at the end of the last episode on your research career. Um, let's go into the, the details of the research, the sort of types of research you've been involved in. I'm, I'm also interested in the, the parts of the audience who might want to get into research themselves, but also clinicians who are just interested in the tendinopathy pain research. So what about, what if I ask you for a bit of an overview of some of the papers that you've been involved in, the thing, the papers that you think have you're most proud of? Sure. So the papers that there's been a number of papers that I'm exceptionally proud of. Um, some of them by students, some of them that I've led, but, you know, I'll go through a couple of them and I'll also go through um, some of the challenges that we've had with some of those papers. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the original um, isometric isotonic study that I did in the lab with TMS and I had a very small number of people and I had a very specific research question. So my tip for anyone reading research is to really make sure what the research paper had set out to, to look at because then you can't apply that to everything under the sun. You can only take away what they did. So we compared um, isometric and isotonic contractions for people with patellar tendinopathy, and um, that was the hardest study that I ever did. So I just had a little baby, and I had this protocol of, you know, baseline. One week later, I had piloted this study for 18 months to get the two uh, groups matched for um, rating of perceived exertion. And I had this strict protocol of bringing people back to the lab at the same time of day, the same day per week. So I, I had controlled their load the day before. Um, and I had this three-week window of baseline intervention one and crossover. I had more people collecting data than there were in the study because I was determined for it to be blinded and perfect and all the rest of it. And um, I'm really proud of that study because it, it, it's exceptionally rigorous in how I did it. Um, and the downside is that people read the abstract only and they then ask you a question like, well, which is better, isometrics or eccentrics? It's like, actually, that's the wrong question. The right question is, how do we incorporate different types of load within tendinopathy rehab? And are you talking in season? Are you talking rehabilitation? So I want people to be really thoughtful about the research they read um, and know that you can't apply you know, what's done in a particular environment to everything. And a good example of that is the eccentrics, Luke. We used to think the eccentrics were good for everything. And then the Viznes study showed that you actually can't give them in season. They're too high on top of in-season loads. So taking something and just applying it across the board will never work. Um, I'm really proud of, uh, so I've got a couple of current PhD students. Miles Murphy's done some fantastic high quality systematic reviews on Achilles tendinopathy that's game changing. He's one to watch out for. Um, Maddie Hannington's done some wonderful work in the anterior knee showing that you can't just do a load test. So, you know, in clinical practice, how we might get someone on the decline squat. Well, the problem is the decline squat 
in itself is not diagnostic. It provokes lots of anterior knee pain. So unless we ask people where their pain is and really get the the nuts and bolts of the test, then in research, we're at risk of including a really heterogeneous group. And that frustrates the crap out of me because you'll read research where some people got better, some people got worse, some people stayed the same, more research is needed. No, more better research is needed. So that leads me to the last paper that I'll mention, and this is not the only one, but we did a consensus statement on participant characteristics. So basically inclusion criteria, researchers need to do better at reporting who are in their studies so that we can translate research because I think it would be really difficult at the moment as a clinician to go through the research and have a clue of how to manage tendinopathy. I think it's really hard to put it all together. Especially if you're only reading the abstract as well. Especially and if you're only reading the abstract spot well, on, which is hard in terms of firewalls and access and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, but assuming you can get, look, there are ways of getting full text copies in email people who work like myself Maybe I won't dob you in, but email people like myself, and I will be happily to happy to share with you up full text articles that I'm allowed to share and build up your network in that way. But assuming you can get a full text, when you um, when you're looking at the methods of the study, so from what you're saying there, you really need to think about who is in the study and then read the aims and think about what the aim of the study was. You've nailed it. The first part of a study that I want people to read is the method, not the title and the abstract. So the title is always catchy. It's clickbait these days to get you um, to, you know, be horrified or excited. And then the abstract is a very condensed version. Go to the method, find out who is in that study and does it represent the person in front of you in any way? If they say tendinopathy as diagnosed by a sports physician, tear the paper up. That's rubbish. It's garbage. It's not good enough. You need to know what load tests they did, how they reported the pain location, tendon pain behavior. You need to know what sex um, the person is, what their physical activity levels are. If they screen for comorbidities, you need the sort of level of detail that you would take in a subjective so that you can say, this is like the person in front of me, or it's not. The person in front of me is 25 kilos overweight with diabetes. Maybe I can't use the same the same kind of principles. Um, I think the biggest misinterpretation or lack of consensus actually comes around how we diagnose tendinopathy. So if your diagnostic criteria are poking the tendon, then you are going to include a really heterogeneous group of people because we know that the patella tendon is one of the most sensitive structures in um, patella tendinopathy patellofemoral pain and knee OA. So you're going to include a really diverse group. And so I'd say to you clinically and in research that it's very sensitive, but not specific. So the problem then comes, Luke, if we have a whole ton of people in a study with patellofemoral pain and patella tendinopathy, then we get, we do get really mixed outcomes. And then we say, oh, maybe that doesn't work. Tendons are a spring. So by definition, if that's the definition you use, then by definition, anything static or slow won't bother them. So clinically, if you put someone on a leg extension machine and you've got them doing an isometric or an isotonic and their pain is getting worse, revisit your diagnosis. So do I think isometrics are good for all anterior knee pain? No. Can it provoke patellofemoral pain? Yes, absolutely. It can really provoke them. So um, it can be useful, but, you know, then you've got to work out what your management is. So it's a useful piece of information. But that's where the misinterpretation has come in is that if you replicate um, studies we've done, but you don't agree with how we diagnose tendinopathy, um, you know, and you might include a whole lot of middle-aged female runners, I would say I suspect we diagnose tendinopathy differently and that's an issue. So read the methods first. Mm, that's a really good point there. So how's research, uh, fair to say tendinopathy is a really good example of a, a field of, of interest or an area of physio that's really evolved in 20 years, in the last 20 years, the last 10 years in particular. So how's it changed what happens in the average physiotherapy clinic, do you think? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think access to the summary of research has improved by things like podcasts and infographics. and um, But the downside of that is that anyone can jump on Twitter and be an expert. 
And so it's really hard to know which voice to listen to, particularly as a, a, a early career researcher or an early career clinician. Um, so I think we have access to a lot of information, but knowing uh, which sources to gather that from can be really difficult. I think the things, um, I think we physios have positioned themselves really well to manage tendons in the last 20 years because the best evidence is for exercise. So that's a good thing. But we need to make sure that our principles of exercise prescription and progression are excellent because other professions are like chomping at the bit. You know, exercise physiologists understand exercise prescription better than us. So that's an issue, but we understand pathology and diagnoses. So we're really well positioned, but we actually need to make sure we hold the line and um, position ourselves by being the experts. And when I'm asked to see, um, you know, second and third and 10th opinions of tendons, if I see someone with an Achilles tendon that's seen four or five or 10 physios and they've not been given any car phrases, I want to cry. Um, so I think we need to make sure we are being evidence-based and the best evidence in musculoskeletal conditions is exercise, but it's knowing what your start point is and how to progress the person in front of you. So you need to be evidence-based, but not recipe driven. Mm. So that leads us to other management principles of tendinopathy beyond, um, exercise education. How would you manage if you had... 30 seconds to summarise management of tendinopathy. What are some of the key things that you would focus on? Yep. Get someone to understand load because if they understand load, they'll know what loads provoke them. They'll lo know how to space their load out during the week. So if they understand high tensile load and compressive load, you can give them strategies to reduce it. Tell them when to listen to their tendon. They should listen the day after, not during. Tendons are sneaky and they'll warm up. So someone will either under load because they're sore at the start or do too much because they've warmed up. So teach them that their tendon pain needs to be low and stable, doesn't need to be zero, low and stable the day after a load. And if their load's going up and their pain's low and stable, that's a happy tendon. Teach them that you can't stop at strength. Most of the programs in research are strength-based because it's easy to control two groups and look for a definitive time. Well, people don't come to see us for four to six weeks or 12 weeks. They come to see us with a goal, not time. So their goal might be returning to function. That's never a research um, aim. It's never return to function. It's we did a 12 week intervention. So um, making sure you can take someone from, from a strength program back to spring. What are your interim steps of teaching the tendon to be springy again? So how do you take someone from their current capacity to their goal? and take them up in progressive stages, getting to them to listen to their tendon. That's I'm sure so it wasn't 30 seconds. <laughs> that's No, that's good. That's so good. And look, the purpose of this isn't to go into everything in every detail. It's just to give everyone a, a really nice overview of how an expert conceptualizes and thinks about um, you know the problem. So let's finish off with resources that people can read further on for uh, perhaps clinicians or even people with tendinopathy. Where can people go to read more about obviously the papers and try to find full text versions and read the methods, read the aims? But um, what about general resources and where would you steer people? So we're developing, um, we've got a little tendon tribe and we're developing resources that we'll put up through the Latrobe Sport and Exercise Medicine research page. So they'll be available. And our plan is now that every time we do we produce a paper, we provide a resource for clinicians and we provide a resource for patients. So that's our goal now with every paper. And that will be a video that'll be free or an infographic or something like that, just so that we can really distill down a nice clinical message. Um, I've never actually put anything on YouTube, but I'm told I'm on YouTube. So if anyone's particularly interested in um, like a, a simple explanation of the brain and how it controls um, movement and how it changes with pain, you can just like Google one of the uh, conference presentations and that'll come up. So yeah, there's, and Jill has heaps of great free resources too. And there's lots of different podcasts on the specifics of tendons. You go search for tendons in the podcast apps and 
and then your name will pop up along with Jill and Craig and many others. So I'm mindful yeah. of the time we have, we have just a short time to talk about this, but you've really hit on some really important points for everyone to read further about where can people go to find more about you and your work? You know, you've got um, some, re- you mentioned Well, I'm not too. on social media, yep. so um, <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully my work will keep coming out and it'll be at their journal club or something. Well, you mentioned the Latrobe Sports and Exercise Medicine webpage. That was a really good idea to steer people towards, have a bit of a look at all the great work you guys are putting out. And it was really, it was really interesting that you're mindfully trying to put out resources for everything you do for patients and clinicians. So there's something in there if you're listening to this as someone with tendinopathy or you're listening to this as a clinician helping people with tendinopathy, it's something that you can check out. Well, we're out of time, Ebony. I hope we can do this again, but thanks so much for coming on Physio Foundations and I'm sure everyone's really looking forward to doing some further reading on those areas and and is inspired by your story. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you very much for having me. 